Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Feeling Seen, the podcast that talks about the movies that make us feel seen. And my co-host for the day is coming to us from international lands. It referred to us by another uh, wonderful recent guest that we had on the show. Mike Kaplan said, I met this great comic at Edinburgh Fringe, and I think he would be really good on your show. So if you should uh, connect with him and see if that's something you're interested in. And we were. We were very interested. And this comic, as I mentioned, uh, had performed recently a set at Edinburgh Fringe that he will be touring. You could be familiar with two of their previous specials, The Bubble and Romantic Comedy. And then he's also recorded another called Strongly Agree that will be on the way. So you got a lot of content to consider for Stefan Allen. Uh, Stefan, welcome to the show. Is there anything else that people need to know about you at the top before we get started? Uh, thank you very much. No, I don't know, really. Uh, what do people like knowing about me? I am a stand-up comedian. Uh, mm-hmm. I've done six full shows in Edinburgh. Um, I usually tour them. And yes, I'm, I've recorded this one to release as a special. That's the first time I've done mm-hmm. that. Uh, and I think... Oh, that, yeah. congratulations! <laughs> it's Well, it's stupid, isn't it? Because all the others were worth recording and I never did um yeah I, th- I think the attitude in British comedy is very different uh, so I'm from Wales uh mm-hmm. w- which is uh the, the the least known I would say of the of the big countries of the United Kingdom and uh <laughs> uh and yeah I, th- I think the attitude is different so it was fascinating I've loved meeting American comics at the Edinburgh mm-hmm. Festival because uh, of course people come from all over the world to that festival and yes yeah, yeah. seeing the Amer- it's massive right it's like huge. it's massive yeah. So yeah, so I would do my own show every single day. That was an hour long. And then the rest of my day is spent promoting myself by doing other people's shows to try and bring people to mine. So mine this year was at uh, 11.45 in the morning. So I'd finish my show and then, cool, I'm doing five more shows. And uh, some wow. people can do even even more. When When you submitted your choice for who you felt seen by. My little millennial heart started beating so fast. So please tell the folks at home which characters from the same movie you have brought for us to discuss today. So I feel seen by the film 13 Going on 30, and I am (laughs) submitting Andy Serkis and Jennifer Garner's characters from this film. Now, did you... Was there one... Has it been like at points in your life you've been one more the than the other, or when you watched this, were you like both of these people make sense to me in simultaneously? Well, yeah, I think I think I relate more to Jenna's experience, which I think makes sense. She's the main character; mm-hmm. she goes through a big mm-hmm. thing in this film, uh, and I've been watching this film. I've watched this countless times uh, over the last <laughs> twenty years, and. So so I think I always connect with her experience. And it's interesting that I st- watched this first as a teenager, uh, which, as as Jenna is, both at the start of the film, and really she's a teenager forever, right? The concept of this forever. film. Forever, yeah. This is a big scenario. Yeah. This is a big scenario. So e- even when the, the when Jennifer Garner is playing her, she is a 13-year-old trapped in the body of a 30-year-old. Um, mm-hmm. So, so you know, originally I watched this as a teenager, imagining what it would be like to be older. And now, as a millennial myself, I am now mm-hmm. older, you know, looking back. You know, this has now become a nostalgic film. You know, I've, I'm, I'm now older yeah. than Garner was when she filmed this. So I, th- I think I always it, it sort of feel... S- I connect to her experience a lot. And... Mm-hmm. And I loved rom-coms, you know, my one of my early shows mm-hmm. was called Romantic Comedy for a reason. But I think mm-hmm. the thing about Andy Serkis in this, and I've just, I've literally just watched this film. I'm literally still in tears from watching it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it was, it felt so good to get back into it. It's, it's, if, if you're in the States, guys, it's on Netflix. So get back in there and watch 13 Going on 30. And, um... And yet, I still... Richard, that's his name, isn't it? Andy Serkis. Mm-hmm. Um, so, the editor-in-chief of Poise Magazine, yes. where Jenna Rink works. So, here's the thing about this character. I'll, I'll talk about him, because I think I feel seen by him in a very specific way, because I'm mm-hmm. bisexual, and as a queer mm-hmm. man who wasn't out when I first watched this film, wasn't even really out to myself, I had a lot of denial. Mm-hmm. Um, and also, uh, the history of 
being a queer man in... So this film is out in 2004, which is also Mm -hmm. the year that the British government repealed what's known as Section 28. And that was Mm. the famous law in this country that meant that teachers were not allowed to teach LGBT issues to children in schools. Okay. So, So basically, I had left school not being taught anything from that world. We were taught AIDS, but without mm-hmm. ever mentioning that, you know, AIDS predominantly affected gay men. We were, yeah. we, so, so we would, and, and, you know, there was the, there these stories of like the library being cleared of any novels with gay characters in it. Although how many novels did have gay characters in them? You know, we were, th- mm-hmm. th- this was not a dominant thing even at the time. And mm. and it was sort of illegal. So you could only really see queer men represented in the media. And even then, mm-hmm. in ver- it was very... The, the representation was very limited. You mm-hmm. might... So there were basically two types, right? Which is either... Um, the the sort of funny witty gay best friend character gay best friend yep or you would have a, the sort of ooh kind of perverted slight over sexualized yeah. character and i guess richard mm-hmm. is gay best friend really that's the trope he falls mm-hmm. into um and but i don't want to play that down because actually he was really important to me because he it, you'd be it, it's easy to forget that his sexuality is mentioned in this film because mostly yes yeah. i had forgotten that mm. like watching it rewatching it for this like it, when it comes up and then she you know jenna asks him she's like are you gay yeah and he just bursts into a fit of laughter yeah that's it and, the, and so and, and it's a continuation of a joke that throughout this film jenna basically she skipped 17 years of her life so the idea is that Jenna, aged 13, wishes she could be 30 because she is, yes. you know, she's she's got one loser friend, Matt, who we know has a heart of gold and is wonderful, but she's too cool. Wonderful. Um, and she she craves being a member of the six chicks, these, like, just horrible <laughs> girls who clearly don't have a nice time, but they are very uh-huh. cool. And she... Well, they're very cool, and one of them is Brie Larson. One of them is Brie Larson, and one of them is Hannah from Pretty Little Liars. Did you spot that? Yes! <laughs> <laughs> Benson. And like neither of them have lines. It's just amazing. Um, <laughs> the, the casting in this film is absolutely incredible. Uh, oh god, yeah. And so, and so the idea is that she. So, so, so there's no. She wishes she could be thirty. She just mm. skips the seventeen years. So she just wakes up aged thirty and has forgotten everything that's happened. But everything mm. she's done is clearly what she would have done to get the life that she wants. So we find out... Right, it's everything she thinks was the right thing to do to get the life she considered the dream. Yeah. And so she's been horrible. She's betrayed her best friend. She basically, like, felt, like, dumped Matt, became friends with the horrible girls, uh, and has been... has just backstabbed her way to the top. And so, yes, she has her dream job, but she is secretly selling out her own company mm-hmm. and her own fr- she has no friends nobody likes her and she doesn't yeah. she is not a good friend to anyone but then suddenly she's the, her 13 year old self in this body trying to make do so that, so that, so that's the joke is that richard relies on her because she's very good at her job yes and so she has to try and pr- pretend that she isn't just a 13 year old girl and mm-hmm. Richard just thinks she's being funny. So she is yeah. constantly saying moronic things because she is ignorant of the world. And every time she does, he just thinks, oh, classic Jenna. <laughs> and the final version of this joke is, you know, Jenna has brought her her former loser best friend, uh, now a very attractive Mark Ruffalo, um, mm-hmm. in to take photos for the magazine and Richard the boss is is just wild about these photos oh my god these photos are incredible who's the secret photographer she says ah this is Matt and Richard says is he Arthur or Martha is he Arthur or Martha oh, Matt it's Matt no no is he gay are you gay <laughs> and he laughs yeah. And I think it has taken me 20 years to work out why that moment is so important to me. And it mm. is because when you're a kid, you don't realise mm. there are such things as tropes and tried and tested, like, archetypes. Right. You are learning about the world through the films that you watch. 
And what I learned in this film is that you can be gay and you can be the editor in chief of a fashion magazine. Now I realize that probably mm. sounds very funny now. <laughs> um, <laughs> because the idea of a heterosexual editor in chief of a uh, of a of a fashion magazine. Um sure. But but as a kid I was like, oh I didn't know that you could just be gay and that would be fine and then that didn't need to be a story, it didn't need to be a thing. And more yeah. to the point, you wouldn't be judged for it. You know, I went to a school where homophobia was rife and being gay was not a thing anyone would be proud of. No one was mm-hmm. out. Even the boys that you knew for a fact were obviously yeah. gay were never publicly out because the bullying would be I insistent. remember that about my high school experience yeah. as well and so the idea that you could grow up to live in a world where being gay was just absolutely completely fine and yeah. more to the point that asking someone if they were gay they would just laugh because obviously I'm gay of course I'm gay I'm f- <laughs> yeah. unapologetically completely outwardly gay was mm-hmm. really, I, I, di- I didn't have words for what that experience felt like, and I think I didn't discover them for years. And so as I grow up and as I come out and I, as I start living, and, you know, I'm a stand-up comedian, this is also a world where being queer is fine. I can be bisexual in this world. I can talk about it mm-hmm. on stage. And, pre- and really that's accepted. You know, in the arts, I think mm-hmm. it is much easier to be to be out and queer. In fact, this so this was another... Because um, another film I considered doing for this, but then I checked and you'd done it on the podcast already, was uh, the film Midsommar. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, oh, yes, our debut episode. It was episode. your debut episode, which was Emily, who's, I think, surname... I, Emily St. James. Emily St. James. Emily St. James. Um, mm-hmm. Whose work I loved because I watched all of Mad Absolutely. Men in lockdown and read all her brilliant, wonderful recaps of that. And I listened to that episode mm-hmm. and was like, oh, this is just brilliant because... Again, I think what she sees... I'd I'd love to know her thoughts on this film, actually, because I think this film does Mm. also feels like it represents the trans experience because so much of it is about Jenna Rink's joy. Now, of course, she's a Mm -hmm. she remembers being a thirteen year old girl, but she's excited to have the body of a woman, and yeah. So, so there, so there is something incredibly queer about this story that is ultimately a romance between a heterosexual couple, but. Well, and it, I, I think that there, I mean, just topically, a what a what a buy feast uh, to mm-hmm. have Jennifer Garner and Mark Ruffalo before your eyes, oh, and for and everyone. just yeah, something <laughs> for everyone there. Well, and I, I like what you said about like you know to be young and to not be aware of stereotypes, mm. but and then to have like a purpose that I you know I I on this podcast have talked about like. The, the idea of the Mary Sue being a bad trope is something that I take issue with because I have friends who are Mary Sues mm. and they're real and they're wonderful and actually just, you know, no, th- there are there are women who do fit that build. They're not like the impossible dream of men. They are, in fact, even better in real life. But like the notion of queer stereotypes that play into that bigness, that swishiness that could be con- seen as a pejorative depending on your outlook what it also works as for people who aren't steeped enough in the world or exposed enough to the bad things about cliches is that it's a big signpost that you can very easily see from a distance a big bright light that says to you if these are things that feel familiar to you welcome in here is somebody who is like you it's not you know the subtlety isn't in the details and it's unfortunate that there is this co-opting of these traits uh these big gay traits that you see sometimes where like it gets slapped on people in pain with a broad brush and turned into a negative stereotype when those sorts of details i know those gay people and those people are beautiful like stereotypically gay people are also beautiful gay queer people yes and so i'm glad that you brought up that notion of like before i knew that i was supposed to think of this as something to associate in any direction, positively or negatively, I just knew that it registered high enough for me to be able to connect with it. And I think that's really important. Yeah. I think the problem is that there is a certain type of person that wants to present homosexuality in negative ways for various reasons. And that, and the risk is that as queer artists, we can try and go, oh, no, 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 we're not like that. But actually, it's fine to be like that. It's fine, you know, whatever, whatever, the, 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 the idea that we, 
need to prove that we are serious, that we are mm-hmm. to be taken seriously by saying, I'm nothing like the, the negative stereotype. Well, maybe I am in some ways. Like, yeah. <laughs> that, that is fine. And... Um, and and so and so the, the the other risk we have. I mean, I, so I think about this a lot because um, I do go out of my way to talk about my sexuality on stage. But also, I I go out of my way to talk about mine all the time. Yes. Panromantic gray asexuals represent us. Yes, there, you guys. yes. <laughs> and and, that, and and that's the thing, right? Because especially when uh, did you say aromantic was one of yours? Pan romantic, gray asexual. Gray asexual. You know, if, right, if not yeah. me, who yes. to talk about? Well, this, yeah, because. That is such a difficult identity to represent in film. Yeah. Be- because, <laughs> yep. Since, since films are so much about, you know, the, the, the fact is the character I relate to the most in this film in terms of experience is Jenna. But this is the thing, mm-hmm. like the romance scenes are the bits I'm least interested in. I'm much yeah. more interested in the idea of her as a person who is trying to fit into a corporate world that wasn't built for her. And yes. And what does the film have to say about that? And it's got loads to say about that. And that's what it means. It is, 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 is For me, being a queer person is that my queerness is incidental. 99% of the stuff that I do in my life is not directly linked to my sexuality. Yeah. And yet everything I do is linked to my sexuality mm-hmm. because the world makes yeah, it. Everything, yeah. world makes it a big deal. And you've... And, and yeah, and and so, so being able to sort of filter through that lens, um, yeah, I, I I just think is is a huge thing. So when I talk in about my life in stand up, you know, my life, I am not the protagonist of a movie. I'm just a normal mm-hmm. person doing normal stuff. So my stories will mm-hmm. be, you know, stories about doing the washing up or like how annoying it is when you're stuck on a train or whatever. Normal stand up stories. Yeah, and yet yeah. the sexuality aspect of it is. This is important. You know, sometimes when people see my shows, it is the longest they have ever heard a queer person talking. Absolutely. Um, and, and I think that, you know, podcasts do brilliant work in that regard as well. You know, that if you want to hear mm-hmm. someone's perspective, you can hear, you know, podcasts are amazing because they can be long and they and they can be, they do not need to be like little tiny snippets. They don't have to be these curated nuggets of experience. Yeah. You can listen to hundreds of episodes of a person talking about their experience and really really get into the nitty gritty and you learn two things right which is that they are a person and that their sexuality Mm -hmm. is 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 part of them it is i i the the ask me we're like it's it's a part of of 10 percent of the things i do but it's a part of 100 percent of the things i do of course my sexuality Mm. i'm glad you brought because like that's something that i is so present in my life i'm recently married and i i've been i've been out and queer for a very long time my spouse like this is her first queer relationship wow, and yeah. like one of the conversations we had early on was like me being like listen you have gone through your life as a a pretty straight girl and that is so sanctioned by society mm. like it you know being a woman it's hard out here but in terms of like who we prize and protect and who we don't screw like who we consider desirable and safe it's like pretty straight white women I was like, you are now entering into a relationship where you will, you are suddenly going to be a part of a conversation you've never been a part of before, and not because you asked to be, but because it's more problem for everybody else than it is for you. So, if you like, I like, however many conversations, whenever we need to have those conversations about just the fact that like your life is now subject to a kind of public scrutiny, a version of which you have never lived under before, like. Let's keep that line open because I understand that this is now like you're in the microscope now and that like your sexuality might be one percent of the things that you do in your life, but it is now part of a hundred percent of the things that you do in your life. And that's a fascinating conversation to have with a person that you're like embarking on an intimate relationship with. Yeah, I I mean, that's it. So, So I'm also married to a woman, which is fine because it's one of the options and Congratulations, everybody. Everybody should have the treat of being married to a woman, honestly. It's, it's the best gender. Uh, <laughs> of, the, of, the, of the most common two. Um, yes. the, yeah, so I've been with my wife for 19 years. Um, she's bisexual as well. Oh, congratulations well. to that. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Uh, we got together the year that 13 going on 30 came out. I'm <laughs> <laughs> Class of 2004. Yes. <laughs> um, so I don't know. Yeah, I think... 
that 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 becomes that becomes a part of you and 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 so seeing yourself as i think as a queer person is mm-hmm. you know we we want to th- we want these great role models and of course you know the world is better now you know i i god imagine growing up in a world of steven universe and heartbreaker oh. um and yet i still think there is room to discuss these things through metaphor i don't think the metaphor has to mm-hmm. go away and so this is these are some things that struck me watching the film this time is mm. that jenna rink is representative of a queer character even though she isn't queer yeah because she which is essential to our history yeah. as queer people consuming media the veiled representation of who we are and us co-opting it and deciding like you are my metaphor now yeah like i don't know what a straight person sees when they watch this film because i don't know how you can <laughs> understand the story of a woman who is different on the inside to what she is presenting mm-hmm. on the outside but Mm-hmm. Parts of her inside keep bleeding out, and so she has to explain it away. And her way mm-hmm. of explaining it away is by making it a joke, and by having yeah. friends around her who can cover for her. And isn't Judy Greer a fascinating character in this film? Because yeah, she, fascinating. In, she's a terrible friend. You know, she's she's vicious and betrays Jenna consistently and constantly. She's a yeah, she's an opportunist, person. pure opportunist. But you, but you watch that first. The first time we meet her when she's when she's an adult, what does she do? She covers for Jenna consistently. She goes, right, this woman is going through something and mm-hmm. I'm here to have her back. So she is the one explaining away her behaviour in the meeting and going, don't worry, she's just hung over. Just as the excuse for why she's acting yeah. erratically. She's actually a very good wingmate in that scene. So, mm-hmm. big picture, this is a vicious, backbiting uh, uh, <laughs> yeah. pot kettle biatch, as, uh, as Jenna puts it. You know what? You can be the pot and kettle all by yourself from now on. Biatch. Come on, Matt. What did you call me? Exactly, yes. And yet, you know, she is still there providing a very human service. Which is to which is to cover for her friend. It's a complicated mm-hmm. friendship, you know. It's really, it's, it, yeah. Well, a friend of me, I suppose, is the word we'd use now, isn't it? Of, of course, yes. Well, I wonder, like, if you know, in terms of the like the, the two, I feel like two sort of key aspects of of Jenna that you know are on the surface for us to to grab onto are you know that notion of when you when you were younger and perhaps like as a as a queer young man or or you know apart from that entirely were you someone who was also like I can't wait till I'm 30 flirty and thriving like was that like I am not like I'm not fitting this adolescent environment and I just wish I could be in a mature enough place to where I could finally feel like myself or alternately do you feel like you woke up at I by myself I'm 38 and I remember the last 17 years very well, but at the same time, I do feel like they also just vanished and I went from being 21 to 38 and the in-between is like, wait, how did it go so quickly? Well, t- yeah, time is strange, isn't it? It's really, in some ways, life can feel long and in some ways it can feel like it was only yesterday you were at, <laughs> uh, getting out of school. I think I, I wasn't like Jenna in school because I mm. didn't think it got better, is the truth. Um, oh, okay. I, okay. I, I, no, I, that sounds really bleak. But actually, all I mean is, I just thought, oh, I just thought I'd always be like, I, if I was very romantic. I desperately wanted a partner. Um, mm-hmm. You know, I think that's why I was drawn to rom coms. But when I look back, actually, mm-hmm. what I was craving was emotional connection because I had friends mm-hmm. in school, but they were all boys, and a lot of them were straight boys. Yeah. And you know, in at, at a time where to show loving affection for your male friends as a boy, um, you know, it, like it just really wasn't done. And then I mm-hmm. started making friends and they were also closeted queer people. And we never mm. came out to each other in those... Well, you know, it wasn't until after school we came out to each other. And yet... But there was something, there was some connection that was drawing us. And it was all through art. We'd talk about the books and the films that we love. And so it's lovely to have 13 going on 30 as a thing that, you know, still gives me that pleasure. And yeah, you know, there's bits. Mm -hmm. It is interesting seeing the bits that 
are very much of their time. Uh, yeah. <laughs> like, oh, I'll tell you what made me laugh this time was there's a, gr- like, the bit in the wedding. So, uh, oh, like, uh, spoilers for the end, but it's a rom com. You can probably see it coming. Yeah. We see Matt and Jenna getting married at the end. And I was like, you know, it's 2004, so they know racial representation is important. So they've made sure yes. there's, like, various people of colour in the in the photos. But I'm like, who mm-hmm. are they to Jenna and Matt? Like, <laughs> yeah, like, absolutely. <laughs> like, you have who, absolutely. Who are they to Jenna and Matt? Not. They're in the neighborhood. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's it's funny that like for for a photographer and a magazine editor, uh, they have they have made photos that look like they've been posed for a magazine. Um, oh yeah, uh, and yet what I will say is. This is a film that celebrates friendship, and it does celebrate uh, interracial friendship as well to a certain extent. You know, it, like I, I feel mm. like that would be better now. But e- but even here, the thing I think that speaks to me is what does Jenna do when she finds herself lost and friendless and alone? And the answer is she makes new friends. And like something that yeah. struck me this time, you know, so she makes friends with Becky, who is a thirteen-year-old girl who lives in her building, and it's a bit of a weird friendship because Jenna. <laughs> yeah is 30 but she has the soul of a 13 year old and by the end we realize Mm -hmm. that actually you know she's now got a group of friends she's got a group of of 13 year old girls who come and hang out with her (laughs) and she tells them about men and it's weird and inappropriate but also but also (laughs) but also real and meaningful and i and again i think like there is such a queer reading of this where we think of our friendships as being you know queer people can be sort of wildly inappropriate with each other and there is stuff (laughs) that is you know I, i i think when you are left out of society you have to build your own community yes and so yes and the so the thing that struck me this time is we first meet Jenna. She dreams of being a member of the Six Chicks. She wants to be friends with the Six Chicks. There are six mm-hmm. of those thirteen-year-olds in her flat by the end. <laughs> oh wow! Well assessed. Well assessed. I've watched it a thousand times. That's the first time I've noticed that. Do you love him? Duh. <laughs> <laughs> when are you going to see him again? I don't know. Actually, I, I don't know if I can. What? what? It's complicated. It's a grown-up thing. Well, at least you have someone to dream about. Guys don't exactly want to jump your bones when you're a metal mouth. What is that attitude? We are young. Heartache to heartache we stand. Love is a battlefield. (laughs) She's got what she wants and it's terrible. But then she starts getting what she wants the right way. She doesn't. She doesn't right. want to be the sex chicks. She wants to find her own friends who 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 are mm. genuinely, meaningfully loving, and 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 we also see that you know what does she do in the magazine? She wanted to work on this magazine, but it turns out once she gets there, she's willing to sell the magazine upriver in order to get a better job at a yeah. different magazine. At Sparkle, at God sparkle, damn it! Those bastards. <laughs> And yet, what does she do once she's there? A big chunk of this film is her throwing herself into the redesign. And and she does it not with the Judy Greer character, who we know is a yeah. bad egg, but she does it with her new group of friends, her wonderful... Um, Oh, I, I looked up her name, Marsha, the who plays the secretary, the, the, the assistant. The assistant. Oh God, her, she might be my favorite arc in the whole movie because she starts out with an abusive boss, yeah. and then ends up with like a girl group, and she is just so like I. At the end of that movie, I'm like, in that timeline, I hope that woman went on to get promoted to senior editor because she is a part of that editorial process. Now. Well, that's it. Like my my reading, I quite like the fact that. You know, Jenna gets a do-over. She goes back to being 13. The only thing we know about her when she gets to 30 the long way around is that she ends up married to Matt. We know nothing else. But I absolutely believe that her friends in this timeline are Arlene, uh, played by Marsha de Bonis, uh, <laughs> and, um, and, th- and there's another woman in the office. Is that Rita? No, it's not Rita. I can't remember. But, uh, but Yeah, she th- has like the short brown bob, I think. I know who you're talking about. And it's interesting because it's clear from context. We learn that normally Jenna in this timeline, in the, in the bad timeline, 
her mm-hmm. go-to people were Judy Greer and Andy Serkis. Andy Serkis, make, you know, yeah. Richard makes a point that since when do you leave me out of the loop on things? And yeah. he refers to her and Judy Greer as the dynamic duo. So mm-hmm. we know that normally those are the people she's working with, her her rival and her boss. Whereas yeah, yeah. Gener- the real Jenna Rink, actually what she does is she goes, no, who do I like? Who do I get on with? And those yeah. are the people she builds with. And I think that is huge. And that... That speaks to me like all the happiest times in my life have been when mm-hmm. I haven't cared. And this is true in comedy, you know, stand up comedy. One might think it will reward you for being ruthless and for networking with the most important person in the mm. room, you know, meet the important agents and promoters, like spot right. which comedians are on their way up and grab them and let them, and hang to their coattails until the bitter end. But actually, all of my most positive experiences in comedy have come from just working with the people that I get on with the most, who have those mm. earnest and truthful and loving modes of friendship. And yeah. And and that's and, and sometimes that is someone who's doing very well. And sometimes it isn't someone's it's some it might be someone who's really struggling in the industry. But working together with the right people creates brilliant work. And also it creates these yep. beautiful friendships that is surely the point, you know. That's the That is surely the point. We're going to take a quick break, but I'll be back with more Stefan Allen and more 13 going on 30 dissection. Then I'll have one quick thing before I go about a little indie thriller that has recently come out called Your Lucky Day that we'll dive into a little bit at the end of the show. So do stick around. Have you ever wanted to know the sad lore behind Chuck E. Cheese's love of birthday parties? Or, are Saturday mornings a reserve for cartoons? Or, have you wanted to know how beloved virtual pet site Neopets fell into the hands of Scientologists? Or, how a former Mattel employee managed to grow Sega into a video game powerhouse? Join us, hosts Austin and Brenda, and learn all of these things and more at Secret Histories of Nerd Mysteries, now on Maximum Fun. I'm Yucky Jessica. I'm Chuck Crudsworth. And this is Terrible. A podcast where we talk about things we hate that are awful. Today we're discussing Wonderful, a podcast on the Maximum Fun Network. Hosts Rachel and Griffin McElroy, a real-life married couple. Yuck. Discuss a wide range of topics. Music, video games, poetry, snacks. But I hate all that stuff. I know you do, Yucky Jessica. It comes out every Wednesday, the worst day of the week, wherever you download your podcasts. For our next topic, we're talking Fiona, the baby hippo from the Cincinnati Zoo. I hate this little hippo. Welcome back to Feeling Scene. I'm here with Welsh comedian Stefan Allen, who is doing us the great favor of taking the 2004 Jennifer Garner vehicle 13 going on 30 very seriously. Now let's return to that conversation. Obviously, there's like the iconic thriller dance scene where the the poise party is a bus. Yes. And Jenna's like, well, you need to have music that people can dance to if you want people to have fun at a party. And so she goes out there in the middle of a big like a big full a big dance floor and a big um like kind of banquety hall area, a beautiful foyer, probably it's a museum. And she starts doing the thriller choreo, which in her life as a 13 year old, she has freshly memorized. So she's bringing this on top of coming off top of the dome. And I love that seat. Cause like, you know, not necessarily everybody would join you knowing the choreo to thriller as well yeah. and be able to deliver it spot on, on the floor. But it is kind of, I think when you are maybe an awkward kid or you don't want to be the nail that sticks out because you just want to be like everybody else, like even like Jenna says, like in the beginning of the movie, Matt's like telling her, like, you don't like you don't want to be like, I, I don't know why you want to be like other girls. Like, they're all just the same. Like, you're different. She's like, I don't want to be. I want to be just like everyone else, which is such like a 13 year old pubescent like mindset to have because you just want to blend. There's six of them, Jenna. That's the whole point. There can't be a seventh six chick. It's just mathematically impossible. Besides, you're way cooler than they are. They're totally unoriginal. I don't want to be original, Maddie. I want to be cool. But like, 
it is what resonates so much with me about that dance scene now is they kind of like when you get as you get older, I think it does more often than not bear out that people are just often looking for permission to be themselves a little more or to be a little sillier or to have fun or to do the unexpected thing so when that everybody in that room sees jenna doing something that's like kind of outlandish and being an adult woman doing the thriller choreography at a fancy magazine party in new york city pre-financial crash so you know it was glitzy and expensive (laughs) they had prawns i think yeah there are prawns (laughs) and she's just throwing shrimp tails on the ground and like i think that that's such a, I hopefully a beautiful lesson that awaits a lot of people in adulthood when they're feeling that when they're 13 is that, well, if you just let, if you just show people a little glimpse, like that they can be themselves in a space where they think they have to perform something else, I think they want to take advantage of that more often than they would side eye you or scoff at you. I found that, and especially in queer spaces, I have found that like if something kind of crazy is happening, like in the middle of the room, that energy pulls people in to participate in it more than it does alienate them to stay away from it. Uh, Okay, so I love everything you said there because that is exactly what I thought watching this scene today. Um, Mm. And and, and I suppose because I knew I was going to do this podcast afterwards, I was watching it more consciously uh, sort of thinking about how seen do I feel by this. And I've never really understood... I love the thriller scene. I think it's such a blast. But I've never really... Oh, yeah, it's a blast. I've never really analysed it. I've never gone deep on it before. And I realised actually, Mm. yeah, permission is exactly the word I thought as well. And and Mm. that's what so much of this is, is... Uh, and, and that's echoed later. So later when Jenna redesigns the magazine to be more nostalgic and to be more earnest mm-hmm. and heartfelt and to represent real women rather than uh, the sort of plastic models. Um, what You know, she, she has that line about, you know, I think we all want to recover something we thought we'd lost forever. And yeah, yeah again, I think that is that that feels like a queer experience that... There are things when you grow up, you are meant to put away childish things and you're meant to be a, you know, act your age now and you you are meant to conform. But for most queer Mm -hmm. people throughout history, conforming, the conforming is painful. It's it it, it can be physically painful. At the very least, it's Mm -hmm. socially and emotionally painful. And Mm -hmm. so a lot of queer people go, well, I'm not doing that. I can't fit in this world then. And that's disappointing that there's no room for me. But the plus side of it is once you cut loose from the mainstream, from from the system, then you get to build your own world. And some, you know, Mm -hmm. and and, and I don't want to present this as if like all queer people build an incredible, inclusive, wonderful world. There is plenty of gatekeeping within queer communities. There, Absolutely, yeah. And, and plenty of backstabbing and bitchiness also. But I think the best way to live are also things I've witnessed in the queer community, which is this idea yeah, that just because you've grown up, that does not mean you have to let go of the things that you loved. And... Mm-hmm. And so, so I think something that queer men get in particular is is we can be portrayed, we can be infantilized. Queer men can be seen as like childish yeah. or silly, and 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 I, and, I th- and the thing is, there is an element of truth to the idea that I think queer men are more likely to hold on to their childhood loves. You know, how many queer men love the Wizard mm. of Oz or Power Rangers or, or mm-hmm. Doctor Who and the, these particular sort sure. of queer escapes and yeah. Um, Nobody, nobody I know loves the movie Aquamarine like one of my dear gay male friends. Yes, yes, and that's it. The the, the understanding of these things, and so the idea of Jenna going, look, the reason no one's dancing at your party is because you're doing this like two thousand and four moody kind of atmosphere music. Uh, you can't dance to that, uh, <laughs> and, and and no one here likes each other. So it's, you know, talking isn't going to be a fun experience either. And the magazine is a sinking ship. Yeah, like <laughs> what you need, you need, you need something to enter the bloodstream. You need fun. The, mm-hmm. the phrase she uses later, I think, is um, is fun and silliness. I think oh, there's another word as well. I wish I remembered. Um, let's, let's put life back into the magazine. And- and fun, and laughter, and silliness. I think we all, I think all of us want to feel something that we've forgotten or turned our backs on. Because maybe we didn't realize how much we were leaving behind. 
but fun and silliness is such a big thing this film wants to celebrate. Well, and I think that, like, the idea of, like, infantilizing queer men on screen, like, that feels like such an extension of misogyny because the infantilization of the queer men happens so often by feminizing them. Yes. And therefore, if they are feminized, they are frivolous. If they're more like women, they're more flighty. And, you know, they're not as grounded and serious and logical. They're emotional and they're silly. And so, like, that... You know, the idea of like working through metaphor, like I, I specialize a lot in like like talking about and, and covering uh, horror cinema and in particular like the intersection of queer history and horror cinema and like the place where most queer men I know have found themselves on screen in horror is in Spinal Girls, is in like the great heroines or the great terrible bad bitches or perhaps like the the anti-heroes I would call Carrie like an anti-hero like that like conduit of empathy through the feminized character while the things that are infantilized about them for perhaps being less masculine are are considered to be pejoratives and they're targeted like the reclamation of that kind of has to look something at times as as you know big and yes silly as Jenna Rink doing a thriller dance in the middle of a crowd of people where you take back that moment where you're like I remember when I was side-eyed and I remember when I felt uncomfortable but she in that moment had that happen to her and wasn't even conscious of it and just pushes through it and does the dance anyway and there's just something like it's unfortunate that so much metaphor and grafting onto these protagonists has to be done in lieu of a more broad array of queer male representation, or at least like less masculine male representation. I feel like we're coming into an era where there's much more variety in that now, but still, like, it's just, it makes it like when you were saying earlier, like, I don't know how straight people watch this movie. I think that about every movie. <laughs> I think that about everything. Like, what are straight people even getting out of this? Because what I'm getting out of it feels so essential to it, and they're not even seeing it. What are you even experiencing as a straight people consuming media? I don't really quite know. But, you know, best of luck out there to everybody. Well, and I, supp- and I suppose the truth is, you know, because the other thing you could do is you could represent... Uh, the thriller moment is a neurodivergent moment. You know, Jenna unsubconsciously yeah, sure. does something that everyone's like, oh my God, what are you doing? It's just that she yeah. does it with so much confidence that everyone is is won over. And, 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 and you know, that like, uh, you know, so that's something else I think about. Um, I have ADHD. Um, mm-hmm. I, I, a, a lot of autistic people really connect with my work. Um, mm. So I, I think a lot of my friends are neurodivergent. I think about this an awful lot. And also, even if you're heterosexual, uh, and apologies mm. if you are, that sounds horrible. But <laughs> yeah, it, like, <laughs> for, I'm so sorry. Um, but you know, you'll 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 go through periods of m- mental illness, perhaps, or, or at least low mental health. There are there are, there will always be those things that make you feel a little bit outside of society. And of course, and as much as we talk about the metaphor in the thriller scene, here's one thing that I think is completely literal. The last person to join in the dance is Richard, the gay boss. That's a very good point. He d- he will not join that dance until everyone else is dancing. And when he mm-hmm. does, he knows it. He knows this dance. This yeah. is a man who dances. He dances unselfconsciously and proudly, mm-hmm. but not in the work do of his magazine. Wasn't I home last Christmas? Jenna, I don't know. Doesn't your crowd do St. Bars for Christmas? I don't know. Is this you? Yeah. This is where I live now. Okay, so... Nice seeing you. Matt! Who is St. Bart? Uh, oh, I, oh, God, I'm, I'm, I'm missing my chance to ask you all the questions I've always wanted to ask about this film. Um, I don't know what St. Bart's is. They talk a lot about these holiday destinations in, in the film. <laughs> and I'm like, I have no, like, I gather from context that these are just nice places to go on holiday. <laughs> yeah, the only reason I know about a place like St. Bart's or San Tropez is, which I would have told you is St. Tropez, if you asked ah. me to say it um, phonetically, is because I've watched movies that tells me this is where rich people go on vacation. Amazing. It's like, it's it's St. Bart's, it's San Tropez, it's Ibiza. Um, I think it's Mallorca sometimes. Uh, these are these are places w- that I am financially precluded from visiting. Uh, <laughs> but I, I and I, what there is nothing more 2004 about this movie than the stakes 
of this publishing industry decline. Like, guys, if we don't get our circulation up, like Andy Circus tells the magazines that got bad news, if we don't get our circulation up, we have to dot, 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 redesign the magazine. <laughs> the circs are in. Our numbers are dismal. We're below 600,000 total circulation. Sparkle is closing in on a million. I've just come off the phone with corporate and they have dropped the R word. But redesign? Redesign poise. Wait, wait, wait. Sparkle copies everything we come up with, everything we do. We have to redesign? That's total bullshit. Well, either we redesign and bring up our numbers or they pull the plug. Richard, redesign is a death sentence. No, it's not. It's a chance to have some fun. It's not we have to close. It's not we're going to cut the staff by 50% but do the same amount of work so all your jobs are about to double and your pay is going to stay the same or go down. In 2004, before the financial collapse, you could have a big party like this for Poise Magazine in partnership with Bloomingdale's and the highest stakes possible for your circulation going down was that you'd have to redesign the magazine unbelievable un- unrelatable content for this former journalist it's so funny isn't it it's yeah where, where is Poise wow. magazine now that's that hopefully they've got an online presence <laughs> <laughs> yeah hopefully they're hopefully they're a monthly digital hopefully they like you guys we have lost entertainment weekly in print since this movie came out Poise is a blog at this judy point. greer's character <laughs> is now a cancelled influencer oh <laughs> absolutely amazing sociopathy by just like famously cinema's best friend and Juno- Jennifer Garner's best friend Judy Greer she's she's absolutely incredible i love her so much in this film <laughs> Um, I, I have a couple of other things I want to I want to I want to talk about in this film. First, I want to talk about the yes. fact that it is never explained that in this movie uh, you can buy commercially available wishing glitter. The 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 Matt the the reason all of this starts is because Matty buys mm-hmm. a packet of wishing glitter that works. Yes, and that's just fine. Like what what yeah. what's happened to all the other consumers <laughs> of this glitter? Like how many kids woke up with like monkey paw wishes? You're so right. The 13 going on 30 cinematic universe has a lot of threads to be pulled with the wishing glitter. <laughs> um, and then here's the other thing I think is fascinating about this film is that this is a movie about Jenna waking up in a world where she has made all the wrong choices and it's her going, mm-hmm. I'm going to change. I am changing right here, right now. This is a change yeah. movie. She's going to become kinder. Yeah. She's going to become nicer. She's going to work harder. She's going to be honest and respectful. She's going to stop cheating on her husband, not least of all because she's technically 13 uh, and the men she was yeah. cheating on her husband <laughs> with are gross. She's, not gonna, she's going to stop cheating on her boyfriend who she doesn't care about. And she's going to stop sleeping with other people's yeah. husbands. She, oh, and she, I guess she'll also get rid of that boyfriend. Um and uh, and so yeah, and what's she doing this? You know, she's doing this for friendship, for 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 her for her job, and and ultimately for true love. Oh and yeah, she doesn't get any of those. Actually, she doesn't. she like the, the the this is there's quite a dark story here where it doesn't work. It really looks like it's going to work. You know, right right up with with ten minutes to go to the movie, the redesign is beautiful. And popular, and it works. Yeah. Her boss loves it. Um, she's reconnected with Matty, and they they just they've rekindled this friendship, this relationship. They've even shared a kiss. And yeah, all signs are pointing to happy ending yeah. resolutions in this timeline. And the answer is no. The 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 redesign is sold to sparkle is you know she's betrayed one more time by judy greer because ultimately it's too late she's she's dug her bed is no that's not the phrase she's dug her grave (laughs) and yes and then she goes to matty and he's like it is too late he's marrying someone else and there's nothing so it's it's really interesting that it's easy to think that the message of this film is it's not too late to change but that's not the message the message is sometimes it is too late to change Fingers crossed it isn't yet. You've yeah, got but you yeah. got to fingers crossed you have some wishing dust left in the dream yeah. house. And I like the reinforcement too that like grand gestures are great. Yeah. But they don't actually fix everything with one big broad paintbrush mm. stroke. Like she didn't actually she couldn't actually save the magazine with one brilliant idea. She couldn't get the love of her life to love her back and choose her. 
through like a a whirlwind week, couple weeks of like proving that she wasn't the bitch he thought she yeah. was. Like that it no, it's like no, when you spend a lot of time undoing um good relationships and good things in your life, it takes a lot of time to to tie them back together again. Like it is it actually something you can fix overnight. And I think thinking, like, looking at it like that, watching it this time, like, I thought was a really wonderful aspect of the narrative. So this was just such a joy to go into with this specific lens of consideration. Um, oh, yeah, I've had an absolute blast. I just, I loved it. This was such a wonderful, expansive journey through 13 Gog on 30. I just want to thank you for bringing this text, this richer text than people realize, to our conversation table to discuss today. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I've had a blast. I love this film and I love this podcast. <laughs> Truly, thank you for coming on. Thank you for picking this character. And thank you to Mike Kaplan. Thank you so much to Stefan Allen for your deep textual, extra textual, meta textual work on a Jennifer Garner Hall of Famer. Um, that was so that was so wonderful. Uh, look out for his upcoming tour dates and a forthcoming recording of his special Strongly Agree. We will put links to his stuff in the show notes, of course, to easily direct you. And now, the one quick thing before I go, I mentioned the movie Your Lucky Day, which is a new crime thriller that is out, a little indie crime thriller. Um, We need more crime movies. We need to get back to crime movies like it's the 90s, similar to how we need to get back to erotic thrillers like it's the 90s. But this movie, Your Lucky Day, um, really good, really cool little thriller uh, that the premise is uh, in, in a little convenience store. A dickhead guy wins wins the lottery. He he's got the one hundred fifty six million dollar ticket. He's freaking out. He's celebrating, and a a criminal having a bad night, played by Angus Cloud, uh, sees his chance, and he decides he's gonna hold this man up and take this ticket from him, and he's gonna claim that one hundred fifty six million dollars. Well, things a cop appears on the scene. Things go wrong. People get shot. And then suddenly, it's a small collection of people and Angus Cloud uh, playing the character of Sterling and Sterling telling them all, listen, I can kill all of you. One or all of us can go to jail or we can all get rich. And you can help me carry off this crime like nothing ever happened and, and we split the winnings. And so the movie is sort of everybody committing to this and wavering in their decisions and recommitting to it and the you know various threads of these individual lives and what have brought them to this moment and how they navigate uh what kind of turns out to be like a a sort of Shakespearean level tragedy and how it plays out and it's really good it's a really good movie it's from a writer director named Dan Brown it's based on a short film he made back in 2010 and then had chances to build it out and do a feature over the years always said no and then uh, a producer asked him uh, a couple years ago, like, would you sell the rights to that short to me? And he said no. And then he thought, like, if I'm not willing to give this up, then I need to do something with it. And what does that mean? So he built it out into this cool little crime thriller. And it is, if not the final role of Angus Cloud, one of the uh, very last roles of Angus Cloud, uh, who died earlier this year. Very untimely tragedy. Uh, and he's great in this. Like, anybody who fell in love with Fezco in euphoria the tender tough that he played in that movie uh it's another character that in that way i think will really sort of grab hold of you and it's a really good performance in a movie of really strong ensemble performances and it's upsetting and it's tense and it's exciting and it's messed up and there's a lot of sort of amidst the the fun of the, the crime caper there is also you know moments of reflection of like wow this really is our world so uh, as we say, always support independent film and your lucky day, which is playing in theaters, is an opportunity for you to do so right now. A shout out to Dan Brown on a great movie and um, to Angus Cloud for one of his final performances. Let us let us take stock. Uh, and that, my friends, is our show. You can follow us on Twitter at FeelingScenePod or send us an email at FeelingScene at MaximumFun.org. If you want to follow me, I'm Crew on Twitter. Our theme music is by Andrew Epen. The show is produced by Marissa Flaxbart. Our senior producers are Kevin Ferguson and Laura Swisher. And this is a production of Maximum Fun.
Maximum Fun. A worker-owned network of artist-owned shows. Supported directly by you.